Y'all want to open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I know that most of you know that we're studying through and we're looking at God's amazing grace. And uh, as we've said, we've looked at what grace is. It is uh, unmerited favor is the most popular de definition that you're going to find about grace. And of course, we pointed out in the introduction of this that in reality, the word unmerited is a little bit redundant because if it's a favor, then it's something you don't deserve. It's unmerited. And so uh, we use the illustration if somebody comes to you and says, well, I would like to ask you to do me a favor. Well, they're, they're by implication, they're saying, now, I don't have a way to return this, but could you do something for me? And so uh, we understand the emphasis that the grace of God is something that God has given to us that we do not deserve. Uh, and so uh, we've looked at the definition of grace. Uh, we said we're going through and we're looking at grace in a little bit different way. And what we're trying to do is to emphasize some of the aspects of grace that we really don't think about. Uh, we think about grace as it relates to salvation. Uh, we don't think about grace as it relates to Jesus Christ coming to this earth. And we pointed out that God's grace gave us Jesus in the manger. And uh, as we pointed out, most folks like baby Jesus. <laughs> they, they may not care for the adult version of Jesus, but they, they love the little baby in the manger. That is uh, one of the most popular uh, things about Jesus Christ, that he was born in a manger. Uh, but we also pointed out that Jesus Christ came not just as a babe in a manger, but he also came, and, and this is one of the aspects that we address, as God's sacrificial lamb. Jesus died in the way that we're talking about it, by the grace of God. God's grace led Jesus to die on the cross. And then, of course, we talked about Jesus Christ as a preacher of the gospel. And that's another aspect that people don't really uh, think about Jesus as a gospel preacher, but that's exactly what he was. And then, of course, we talked about Jesus Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And that really is something that people are a little bit hesitant to talk about. They, they like to talk about love, compassion, uh, and they want to, in many instances, ignore the fact that Jesus was and is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5 and verse number 5. But what I want to talk about this evening is, is the amazing grace of God gave us the church. The church was established by the grace of God. So Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1 that as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he says, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now you realize that the book of Ephesians, the the topic that runs through this book is the church. It is the church of Christ. That's, that's the emphasis that Paul deals with in the book of Ephesians. You remember that as he goes to the book of Philippians, he talks about the Christ of the church. But in Ephesians, it's the church of Christ, the church that belongs to Jesus. And notice that he said to the faithful he says, in Christ Jesus. Now, the word in is a location. We are in Christ Jesus. That's where faithful children are. By the way, remember that term. Faithful children are in Christ. Those that have wandered away, those that have lost, they're no longer in Christ. They have abandoned the Christ and they're wandering in the world. But Paul is writing to those that are faithful, located in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 2, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen carefully to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this, who hath blessed us. The us there refers to Christians. 
We have been blessed. He has blessed us, now notice this, with all spiritual blessings and notice the phraseology again, in heavenly places in Christ. So what we're, we're focusing our attention on, the, the uh, spiritual blessings that exist in the church, they came by the grace of God. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. This is a chapter that we all know quite well. You remember in verse number 13 that Jesus had come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples, saying, whom do, the, uh, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, of course, you remember they responded by some say uh, that thou art John the Baptist. Some say that thou art Elias. Some say thou art Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then, of course, Jesus uh, specifically addressed the apostles. And he said in verse number 13, but whom do you say, or excuse me, verse number 15, but whom do you say uh, that I am? And then, of course, Simon Peter, in that uh, impetuous way that he's known for, says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So, so Peter knew who Jesus was. And then, in verse 16, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Notice this, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. You did not find out who I am, Jesus said, by listening to men. Why? Because, go back to verse 13, men are wrong. Well, he's John the Baptist. He's Elijah. He's Jeremiah. He's one of the prophets. Well, that's what flesh and blood was saying. So Peter didn't listen to what men said about Jesus Christ. And I, I submit to you, we need to be very careful when men start talking about Jesus because so many times there are misperceptions, uh, misconceptions, there are uh, biases that are involved. And so if you want to know who Jesus is, the only accurate place to go is the Bible. you got to go to the book. It's the only place you're going to find out. So he says, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. Now watch this, but my Father which is in heaven. So God's divine revelation about Jesus Christ revealed to Peter and the other apostles exactly who Jesus was and is. And so Jesus said in verse 18, and this is the emphasis that we want to look at, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, you are blessed, Peter, because you listen to God. And because of that, I'm no longer, you remember that Jesus said, no longer going to call you Simon, I'm going to call you Peter. In the Greek, it is Petros, and, that, and that's something that we all have heard how many times? But that is a masculine word. You can tell by the O-S on the end. It's a masculine noun, a masculine name. If it is feminine, just as you see it in the Spanish language, it ends with an A. So there is a Petros, which is a small pebble, and then there is a Petra, which is a great foundational rock. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to thee, thou art Petros. And upon, notice this, this Petra. Two different words. I mean, it's the same word, but it's got, one's a masculine word, one's a feminine word. So we understand from this, contrary to Roman Catholic doctrine, the church was not built upon Peter. Brethren, the church was not built upon Peter. As much as we love and respect Peter, Peter was a man. And because he was a man, he was subject to the same frailties that you and I are subject to, right? Mm -hmm. so the church is not built on some man that says, Lord, I'll never deny him. Jesus said, yeah, he No, Lord, it doesn't matter. I'll fight to the end. I'll die, but I'll never deny him. And he turned around and denies him three times. <laughs> now, the church is not built upon a man. 
And by the way, just as a side note, brethren, the church is not even built upon the confession that Peter made, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. The church is built upon the rock, and the rock is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 4. So he goes on to say, in verse 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The point that we want to emphasize, the building of the church by the grace of God. That's what we want to focus our attention on for the next few moments. Let's think about God's plan for the church. I want to emphasize, and, and by the way, this is all things you've heard many, many times, but I want us to first of all understand that this plan of building the church was not an emergency measure. You say, well, why would you say that? Y'all know because the doctrine of premillennialism, which is so rampant in the world around us today, most of the mainline denominations and most of those that have branched off from those, they believe in the doctrine of premillennialism, which in essence says that Jesus came in, in the first century to build the church, well, they would say build the kingdom of God. And then they would say, and this is their language, not mine, the, the Jews surprisingly rejected Jesus. And because of that, God had to set up as an emergency measure the church age. And they say, we're now living in the church age. Wasn't, you can't find anything, they say, can't find anything in the Old Testament that refers to the church age. It's always the kingdom age. And what they fail to recognize is the church and the kingdom are one and the same. And so premillennialism says they surprisingly rejected Jesus the first time. So Jesus had to go back to heaven without establishing his kingdom. And then they say Jesus is coming sometime in our future. And when he comes the second time, he's going to establish the kingdom. And then, of course, you know the rest of that turn out and then he's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years and then ultimately all the saved are going to go to heaven. All those that are punished will be in hell and uh, Jesus will reign then on the throne of God in heaven. That's premillennialism and it's false. Uh, first of all, you don't surprise God. <laughs> Brethren, you don't jump out behind the door and go boo and scare God. You're not going, God knows everything. He is omniscient. So there are no surprises when it comes to God. And, and this is maybe an oversimplification of the case, but it is a fact that you don't surprise God. God knew all along they were going to reject Jesus. How many statements in the Old Testament testify to that fact? Just quickly remember, remember when we were talking about Jesus as the Lamb of God and we were in Isaiah chapter 53, do you remember that in Isaiah 53 that Isaiah specifically said, nobody's going to believe that report. He's going to be rejected by men. Now tell me, written 700 years, 750 years most likely, before the birth of Christ, Isaiah said they're going to reject him as the Messiah and they will not believe that report and then, lo and behold, it's a surprise 750 years later. No, it doesn't work that way, brethren. We know that. So, let's notice just a few statements about the church that tells us it was intentional, not unintentional. Genesis 3 and verse 15. We all know this verse. Uh, I would dare say in Bible classes we've studied it uh, hundreds, and, and I don't even know if I'd be overemphasizing when I'd say thousands of times. I don't know how many times throughout my life as a Christian, and I obeyed the gospel in 1984, I don't know how many times that I've heard teachings on Genesis 3 verse 15. Multiple times. And notice what it says. God is speaking to the serpent in verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, 
and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The thee there, obviously, is the serpent. The serpent is Satan. You can go to Revelation chapter 12. He's that old dragon. He's that serpent. He's the deceiver of the brethren. He is the uh, one that accuses the brethren. I will put enmity, God says, between Satan, between thee, the serpent Satan, between thee and the woman. Notice this. And between thy seed and her seed, it, that is the seed of woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is by every, uh, I guess, uh, scholar that's ever looked at the Bible, the first Messianic prophecy. Everybody knows that that's talking about the coming of Jesus. Now, brethren, if the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come in the very earliest chapters of Genesis, and then as you begin to look through the rest of the book or the books of the Old Testament, you look at the book of beginnings and there is a beginning of sin, but immediately there is the beginning of God's redemptive plan. I'm going to, I know that man has sinned, but I have a plan. And of course, we know that in Ephesians 3 and verse 10, he said, I've always had that plan in my mind. It has been in God's mind for all eternity. That's, that's unfathomable to us. That there was never a moment where God didn't know what he was going to do. But he's God. So that's why it's not unfathomable to him. He knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to create man. He knew man was going to sin. And he knew that the only way to save man is through Jesus Christ. And so, we go to another familiar passage, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. And uh, we begin our reading in verse number 1. Isaiah 2 and verse number 1. Notice that Isaiah writes to these Old Testament Christians, as we said a moment ago, seven to 750 years before the coming of Jesus. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass that in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house, or the mountain of the Lord's house, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. I mentioned before in this translation that I have, it's King James, but it's a study Bible, and it has a little star by all of the Messianic prophecies. This is starred in my Bible, and rightfully so. It's a Messianic prophecy about the coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God, which is the church of God. Remember we read a moment ago in Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. And then do you remember what we read in verse 19? He says to Peter, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now imagine this. If what our religious friends around us say is accurate, then Jesus, almost 2,000 years ago, said to a man by the name of Peter, and ultimately to all the apostles, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 18, he said it to all of them. But he says, now Peter, I'm going to build my church, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, but now 2,000 plus years are going to pass before you can use those keys. <laughs> really? Really? Uh, you think that's what God expected, that there would be this great gap before the kingdom and that also implies Peter and the other 11 apostles well Judas died so he's out those men would have to still be alive if the kingdom hasn't been built yet to use the keys well you got the key Peter where you got the keys well they're in my pocket well where's your pocket <laughs> well it's in it's in that hey being right no let's see it doesn't work does it and so he says look 
The mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established. Verse 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house, or excuse me, the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall ye learn war anymore. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Again, brethren, these are all verses that we know. We're just going to look at verse 44. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 and... Uh, there's a fascinating statement that Daniel makes in interpreting King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He says in Daniel 2 and verse number 44, in the days of these kings, uh, of these kings, uh, we'll show those kings in just a moment, but he says in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Now I want you to think about what Daniel said. In the days of these kings, God's going to establish what? A kingdom. A kingdom. Now if we can tell when those kings reigned and when the church was built, then we will show you very clearly from the Bible that the church was built almost 2,000 years ago and the church is the kingdom. Now that's what we're going to do. So let's turn now to Zechariah. We could go to Joel 2. Uh, another one of those fascinating statements in the Word of God. You can go to Joel chapter 2. Uh, but look, we're going to go to Zechariah. This is one that we don't uh, normally talk about when we're talking about the establishment of of the kingdom or the church. But Zechariah prophesied the coming of the kingdom. In verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughters of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me to thee. I want you to think about that in light of Paul's statement. Keep your finger here. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Brethren, we're asking, has that passage been fulfilled in the New Testament? Let's read that again while you're turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I will dwell in the midst of me. You shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. Is there any statement where that has already transpired? Or is it somewhere out in our future? We'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? I want you to pause there and notice the Bible gives great descriptive terms to describe the church. We, we recognize this in our world today. If somebody were to ask you, who is Terry Clark? Well, I, I am the husband of Terry. I am the father of our three children. I am the grandfather of our ch grandchildren. I am a preacher. All those different designations describing the very same individual, right? We're not saying, well, he's got multiple personalities. We understand, well I might, but we're not saying that. But, but what we are saying is that look, he's all these things because of who he is. So when you see the church referred to as the kingdom or as the temple of God, we shouldn't be shocked by that. We do it all the time. It's just revealing a different aspect. So notice that he said in verse 16, what agreement had the temple of gods with or temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. Now just ask yourself, who was that written to? The saints in Corinth. 
the church in Corinth, right? The church in Corinth. And God says that you, the church in Corinth, and by implication, any faithful congregation of the church, you are the temple of the living God. Now notice what else he says. As God hath said, I will dwell in them. Hmm, wonder where he said that. Zechariah chapter 2, among other places. It's not, it's not only Zechariah, but Zechariah said it. Zechariah 2, we were reading it just a moment ago. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come ye out and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive thee. Now let's go back to Zechariah 2 and verse 11. God says, I will dwell in the midst of thee. That's the church. That's the temple. That's the kingdom. I think that's clear. And thou shalt know, we're still in verse 11, that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah in his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem. Be silent, O all flesh before the Lord, for he had raised up out of his holy habitation. Brethren, I said a moment ago we were going to show the, the uh, fulfillment of uh, Daniel's prophecy. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but notice that Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 2, had a, a, a dream. He couldn't remember the dream. He didn't understand what it meant. So he told him, get this dream. Tell me the dream. Tell me the interpretation. Of course, nobody could do that. So put to death all the uh, soothsayers, all the wise men. Just kill them because they're worthless. So they come to get Daniel. And Daniel's like, what's going on? Well, the king's had a dream. He doesn't remember the dream. He doesn't know the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel said, just slow down. I'll... I'll tell him what the dream is because God will reveal it. So God revealed to Daniel that the Nebuchadnezzar's dream was a statue. It had a head of gold. It had a chest and arms of silver. It had a belly and thighs of brass or bronze. It had legs of iron and at the very bottom it had feet mixed with the iron and it was clay. Clay and iron. And then in Daniel chapter 7 and in Daniel chapter 8, we find out the identification of those kingdoms. Remember, he even said in interpreting the dream in Daniel chapter 2, what is it, verse 40? Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold. You remember that? So the head of gold represents the Babylonian Empire. The next empire, you all know this, is the Medo-Persian Empire. They came in, they conquered uh, the Babylonian Empire, and we find then the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians were conquered by Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire. That is the third kingdom, the belly and thighs of bronze. And then, as Daniel chapter 7 describes it, there is a terrifying beast. And if you've studied Roman history at all, in any level, whether it's high school, college, or graduate, or even on your own, you know that's an apt description of Rome. They were a terrifying kingdom. I, I get a little frustrated at, at all the, the, the remarks that are pointed at, yeah, and y'all have seen some of this this week since the Queen of England died about Britain and all the colonization and people hate, you know, they hate Britain and all this, and they're like, who are you talking to? Because even the people that were under colonialism still love Britain. I told you all, I went to Bermuda, did a, 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 a campaign over there in 1988. They're, they were still at that time, I think they still are under British rule. They, they loved the British for what they had done. But uh, there's no doubt there were things that were wrong with the British Empire or the United States. I'm not denying that. But Rome was a terrifying beast. And it is in this time that Daniel says that in the days of these kings, that's the Roman kings, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. 
Now, brethren, that kingdom either exists or it doesn't exist. And we know that it does exist. Let's quickly notice this. Not only the church in God's planning, but God had a purpose in mind. God, as we mentioned a moment ago in Genesis 3 and verse 15, God knew men were going to sin, and he already had a plan worked out. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to notice what Paul writes to this preacher by the name of Timothy in verse 10. He says, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation, listen to this, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, brethren, we'll talk about in our final study on this, which will come when we get back. I think the date's October 2nd will be the next time we'll talk about this. We're going to talk about God's grace bringing salvation. But notice that in bringing salvation, God had to have, and, and I understand the terminology because it, when you're, it, at least I struggle trying to put it into a way that we understand it. God had to have a place for all those people. And what is that place? Well, it's the church. That's where God has placed us. If you doubt that, we've already studied in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. We'll see some other passages that tell us the very same thing. Where did God say he was going to place the saved? Well, in the church. So that's why we say the, the grace of God brought the vehicle. We could say it if we wanted to use terms like in the days of Noah, the ark of safety. The church is God's ark of safety today. Or we could say it like this in the times... Uh, the children of Israel live. The ark, or excuse me, the church is God's city of refuge. It's God's city of refuge. Those, those Old Testament events, as mighty and wondrous as they were, were always pointing to something else. They were pointing to something even better. And that's the church. So the ark in the days of Noah was pointing to the church in our day. The cities of refuge in the days of the children of Israel were pointing to the church in our day. In those congregations of God's people that exist as our cities of refuge. And so this was done, brethren, to reconcile man to God. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse 16. Ephesians 2 and verse 16. Remember, we talked about uh, verse 12 this morning in our Sunday morning worship service. So I'm not going to reread all that. But he says in verse 13, he sets up a contrast. Gentiles, you were without hope, without God in the world, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise covenant of promises, but now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who were sometime afar off are made now by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, verse number 14, who hath made both one, both Jew and Gentile, that's Paul's point, both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's that old veil that existed in the temple. You had the holy place and you had the most holy place. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn from the top down to the bottom. Now that veil was about 60 feet tall, indicating from the top to the bottom, man didn't rip it. If a man, by the way, they couldn't, but uh, if they could have, they would have had to rip it from the bottom up unless they were standing on scaffolding, right? And so God tore that veil. So God broke down that middle wall of petition between Jew and Gentile, right? And he did this in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh, that is in the flesh of Jesus, the enmity, even the law of commandment, contained in ordinances, 
For to making himself between one new man, so making peace, listen to this, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Brethren, one final thought of how we know the church is given to us by the grace of God. We've already noticed in this study that Jesus shed his blood as God's sacrificial lamb. And we said the Bible tells us he did that by the grace of God. But what happened when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood? Well, Acts 20 tells us, and there's no doubt about what happened. In Acts 20, now brethren, I want you to think about this as we're closing. If, as men are saying, that the kingdom does not exist today, that it's somewhere out in our future, and that God never planned to have the church age, it was a, 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 an emergency measure, he had to do this because men rejected Jesus, then all these passages that we have looked at mean absolutely nothing. But we know that's not the case. So what is the case? The doctrine of premillennialism is the problem, not the Bible. So now notice this. In Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul said to those elders from the congregation in Ephesus, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, notice this, with which he purchased with his own blood. Now, brethren, if you can't see in that, that the Bible is telling us very clearly that by the blood of Christ, the church was purposed, uh, purchased, and that the church was always in God's mind. It was never... Uh, uh, this uh, emergency measure, then we would see that if the grace of God brought us the blood of Christ, then the grace of God also brought us the church. <clears throat> Brethren, I think again that sometimes in our studies, we've neglected this aspect of the grace of God. We have many times, and I, I know. I don't hear every sermon preached on every Sunday. God does, but I can't. So there may be well may well be some that are out there that are that are really emphasizing this, but I haven't met them yet. But I know this: if we don't recognize the full scope of the grace of God, we're never going to appreciate it. Anymore. <clears throat> Did it bring our salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely, no doubt about it. But all oh, the grace of God brought so much more. So much more than our salvation. And I hope as we think about this, it will really help us to appreciate more the grace of God. And it may be this evening that uh, you, you haven't fully realized all that the grace of God has done for you. And we know that Ephesians 2 and verse 5 says we're saved by grace. And we know in Ephesians 2 and verse 8 that we're saved by grace through faith. And when you see that saved by grace through faith, you know this. Grace is God's part, but faith is our part. So do your part in obeying the gospel. If you've never been baptized into the Christ, if you believe in Jesus as the Christ, the sacrificial lamb of God, you're willing to repent of the sins you have in your life, you're willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ, then why would you not want to be baptized and baptized right now? So Brother Don's going to lead us in an invitation song. We plead with you to respond as one of God's children. If you have a need, please come as we stand and as we sing.